So you heard my name, and you heard my background. I've spent <clears throat> better part over over 20 years on the topic of not only the earthquake, which a lot of people have done, but also the reconstruction of San Francisco after the earthquake. So this talk will incorporate both of those, both of those uh, facets of the story. Let's go with a couple of house rules. Um, I'm an old classroom teacher. I never mind if someone raises their hand and interrupts me. So if something you have that that um, something I have said, I know to say, I love your question. Just hang on; it's going to come up, or I'll, I'll answer your question. So that's my my uh, operating uh, mo. Um, and uh, with that, let's start with the story. We're looking at the building here in Chinatown. Right there is another building. That building is Old St. Mary's, the back side of Old St. Mary's. This happens to be the original Sing Fat, uh, they called it a bazaar, basically it was uh, import. Whoops, I moved too, too rapidly for it. Uh, let's see. I'm back. Okay, so they were definitely into uh, dealing with Asian goods uh, at Sing Fat, and they will do it after the earthquake and fire as well. Um, up at the hill here appears to be another church. That was Grace Episcopal Church. Grace Episcopal Church we now know as Grace Cathedral. It's further up the hill. It was very close to Chinatown at the time. That's our, that's our context. That's where we're going. <clears throat> On the left we have Chinatown before the earthquake and fire. It's a small area. It's not very big. It only goes between two blocks. Today, it's even what they, they say it goes further than that. Of course, it doesn't make any sense anymore, but at least the tourist portion of it. So it goes from at the corner right up here, which means it, it's going from, uh, uh, from um, Kearney to uh, Grand Avenue, we call it today. And it goes one more block up to um, uh, huh, my street. Stockton, thank you. Stockton. That's all. It did not go all the way up to Powell. It did not come down a block here. It only had those two full blocks across. They're not full because there are a lot of alleys and so forth. And it's only going from California Street not down a bush, but California Street to Pacific. That's about it. No more. And this is a limited area where Chinese were allowed to, to uh, live. Beyond that, if any Chinese were... Uh, ooh, what's going on here? I don't know. If, if Chinese lived elsewhere, it's because they were houseboys or working for a family in some way. It won't be until after the earthquake and fire that they even go into neighborhoods to run laundries. So it's rather interesting uh, timeline there of when things happen. Top picture, like all the rest of those pictures from that time period, the earthquake is at uh, 5, 12 in the morning, shakes you up. <laughs> May have had some bricks come in your, in your bedroom, but essentially you went out, you put on your best clothes, and you went outside. You didn't have a lot of choices of clothes. You know, you had your, your best clothes, and you had the clothes that you didn't uh, want the world to see. So you had men had one suit, essentially. They all went out, and they all looked, and they saw what was going on. They're starting to see some whiffs of smoke coming up from south of market. Oh, well, that'll never reach us. Guess what? <clears throat> it did. These are Arnold Ghent photos. He worked before the earthquake in San Francisco and only a brief time after the earthquake, and then he moves on to New York. So uh, many of his pictures that were taken during the earthquake were lost. So even though we have some great examples of his work, uh, the stuff from the actual earthquake is rather limited because of uh, damage and uh, 
you go, and that's as far as it went. All right. All right, so here is the first story I want to tell. Bubonic Plague, 1900. <clears throat> so the civic authorities began with denial, then uh, pivoted to blaming the Chinese community because their unsanitary habits. A, court, a quarantine of Chinatown would, be, uh, would, uh, would follow. All the non-Asian press, which was most of the press, obviously, uh, joined in the blame game. Then to the, <clears throat> let's see what I can, I can't even see my own thing there. Then to the point of attacking the public health officer for overreacting to the severity of the unsuspected outbreak of uh, a deadly disease, okay? By 1904, so it starts in 1900, it will last until 1904, this non-epidemic had taken 119 lives, caused economic and structural changes. There was fires, they burned out part of Chinatown to try to get rid of the vermin uh, <clears throat> in portions of Chinatown. This incident became another argument for those who wish to expel or relocate the Chinese inhabitants in San Francisco. So this is bubonic plague. This is the real deal. It had come in from Hawaii. It came by way of ship. At the time, they did not know the relationship between this disease, which goes back to the Middle Ages, and the flea. That had not been discovered, will not be discovered until um, it, the next plague, which comes on uh, a few years later, <clears throat> after the earthquake and fire in 1907, 1908. But at the time, all they knew is it's a plague, your body turns black, you die. It only was in Chinatown. They quarantined all of Chinatown. They would let no Chinese out. They got a little more serious, and there's actually some burning out of buildings and all that kind of stuff. So that's basically the text I created there about this bubonic plague. Uh, we'll have another plague, and I, don't, I won't talk about it, so uh, it comes up right after the earthquake and fire. And uh, that's a, one of many reasons, or a, another justification, to get rid of the Chinese. They are a problem. They're stanky. They don't, uh, they don't behave themselves well. They, don't, are, they aren't like us. Uh, all the kind of uh, trope that goes with, with being racist, it was all part of that story. And, of course, here is the bad boy. James Duval Phelan, major proponent of anti-Chinese restrictions. <clears throat> in an article in the North, uh, North American Review in 1901, he had been, pr he had been mayor for two two-year terms prior to that, so he was well-known in politics. He was a wealthy man. He had owned a lot of property. Phelan wrote, the Chinese, by putting a vastly inferior civilization against our own tend to destroy the population on whom the <coughs> perpetuity of free government depends. Phelan wrote, the Chinese may be good laborers, but they are not good citizens. So he was taking this higher, uh, he wasn't going after the Chinese for their habits, he was going for the fact that they, they didn't participate in civic life. Okay. The next one I pick up is from 1907, same basic uh, argument, but in this case he's using the Japanese, who were the new whipping boys after the earthquake and fire. In 1907 an interview in the Boston Herald, when Phelan was considering a run for the U.S. Senate, he will consider it again in 1920, he was quoted as saying, Chinese, uh, Japanese coolies must be excluded because they are non-assimilable. They are a permanent foreign element. California is white man's country, and the two races cannot live side, uh, live Sci live cannot live. I'm missing a word there. Uh, in in, uh, in peace or side by side, wherever I left out. Uh, inasmuch as we discovered the country first, we got here first and occupied it. We pro propose to hold it against either a peaceful or a warlike invasion. <clears throat> you know why we changed the name of Feeling Feeling <laughs> in front of Sin City College. There's nothing uh, secretive about Phelan's attitude towards Asians. And he's, 
he's equal opportunity Asian. He was against Indians coming from India as well. He was against anybody who was like he and his, his uh, Irish Catholic friends. So he was a wealthy man. He had owned a lot of property. And what do you want me to do? Closer? Okay, good. <clears throat> and he had been a, he'd been a politician, and uh, he had clout. So, the City Beautiful Plan, also known as the Burnham Plan, Phelan had met Daniel Burnham at the Columbia Exposition in 1894 in Chicago and persuaded him to bring a team of uh, <coughs> okay, planners to San Francisco in 1904 to work on a master plan to make San Francisco the Paris of the Pacific, to include more parks, sweeping boulevards, terracing of the hills. The City Beautiful concept was to bring the culture, sophistication, and neoclassical gra uh, grandeur of Europe to the city that had, had evolved uh, on the western frontier with opposing grid patterns and steep hills only you could only get any, uh, climb with a cable car, streets and alleys too narrow for the emerging automobile, particularly in the older sections of Chinatown and North Beach. So he had a grand plan. He hired Burnham. Burnham is a, is a well-known architect. You go to Chicago, there's many buildings have a plaque on them. This was designed by Daniel Burnham, but he was also the big planner of uh, cities as well. Daniel Burnham and his team were commissioned only to create a conceptual drawing <coughs> The implementation of the bold plan would involve the major stakeholders, the politicians, the bankers, the property owners. But they only laid it out. They said, this is what we want. And if you've ever seen the Burnham plan, we've terraced off all of Twin Peaks. We've got tw terracing of, of, of uh, Telegraph Hill. We have various diagonals crisscrossing all over the place. It kind of makes me think of, without, well, I, I think maybe... Washington, D.C. is an example. Obviously, uh, Boston is another example of streets that go at funky angles, although at least there's a concentric system in, in uh, Washington, D.C. One of the privately circulated documents that was found among his, uh, his papers in, uh, in the Bancroft Library, <coughs> circulated documents on how to implement change in Chinatown involved a scheme to create a private company to do the dirty work. The, uh, <coughs> quoted here, the objective of this company is to get title to at least two-thirds of Chinatown, remove the whole Chinese community to a proper and well-improved location on the Bay Shore, clean out the tumble-down rookeries of the present quarter, erect thereon a new business and residence section with buildings architecturally beautiful and harmonious. The whole is to be approached by a broad and beautiful boulevard. That was the plan. This was not public. This was not in the paper. This was in his private papers. And the source, I don't remember where, where it came from. So that was a plan created from this Burnham's plan. If you've seen the Burnham plan, it's grand. I mean, they've got boulevards all over the place. A panhandle would extend all the way to the bay, come down through 8th Street. Uh, there's all kinds of plans that would... In the big picture, we would have run a freeway through some of those streets, but anyway, that was the plan of, of Daniel Burnham. And obviously, uh, <laughs> Jimmy Phelan was part of that story. So I took a look at what that Burnham plan would have done if it affected... Chinatown. So the boundaries of Chinatown, California, Pacific, Kearney to Stockton, you can see them on the map there. I ran California Street through so you had a, an idea of where that lower section would be right down here. The upper is at Pacific. The map is upside down for that. So there's the section of Chinatown. Not very wide, about 10 blocks if you're counting just the blocks. And you see there's a line that comes through, and then I just put dots to, to show you how it would wind around through Chinatown and uh, head up another hill and do all that kind of stuff. And they're going to widen DuPont Avenue. Now, DuPont Avenue until 1909, well, December 31st or December 23rd or something, 1909, would remain as DuPont. The section from, from 
Market Street up to uh, Bush was called Grant. It came from it came from Market Street. It went up to the edge of Chinatown. Chinatown was an old, older part of the city, and so it ran from Bush all the way to the Bay as Dupont. They will change all that in a in a sweeping change of street names in the fall of 1909. Anyway. Look what they're going to do with the uh, <coughs> widening of, of uh, the street that reads up into Chinatown. So we take out all the, they leave Sacramento on one side and clay on the other, but all the buildings would be removed so you could have a wide boulevard from the Embarcadero up to DuPont Street, uh, and you, which you'd already widen. From a perspective of what's left, not much. They've really cut the heart out of Chinatown by creating all these widening of streets and so forth. And you can see what I was referring to earlier. There's your panhandle would come down here and go all the way to the ocean, uh, to the bay, and there'd be wider streets and so forth and so on. One that we don't think about now is the fact that, whoops, what did I just do? Wrong one. Uh, we have here is, is as far as Montgomery Street is, then we're going to extend it all the way down through Folsom and come all the way to uh, the bay. So there's all these kind of grand plans uh, was, was what they were going to do. But you see, I want you to see just what they did in Chinatown. They inviscerated it. They took it all, they took it apart, so to speak. All right, the destruction of the 1906 earthquake. Uh, Sing Fat, that same building I was pointing to earlier. I think I made that. It's the same picture I used in the beginning. So there is... Old St. Mary's right there, and there is the Grace Episcopal Church up the hill. Uh, a massive amount of destruction. It was just, uh, <laughs> what happened was, it was very common. One of the problems San Francisco had is that much of it was brick. Oh, brick, it falls down in the earthquake. Not necessarily. What you have is a brick building, which... You know what fire, fireplaces are made out of? Why they're brick? Because they hold the heat. And in those brick buildings, and I don't know if I have a picture here, but I will have someplace, which along the line of the roof, if I can get up there, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, hang on. Yeah. There usually is a bunch of sockets in the, in the uh, well, there's, there's a line right there. There are little rectangular uh sockets in the uh, in the brick where the floor joists, in this case the floor joists, then the second floor joists, and the top floor joists would be the roof joists, they would burn out because they're wood. The floors were wood. So what happens is fire would puncture any of these buildings and catch everything flammable. However, the nice brick walls created a lovely uh, fireplace. In other words, the heat would be enormous because the flammables are going up, but they're being contained by brick walls. So that's why there were so many problems with fighting this fire, besides the fact there wasn't water, was the fact that the construction of much of San Francisco's downtown had been brick, and the bricks stood up fairly well until you took out all the horizontal supports. Now, in the case of St. Fat, there's a steel beam going through that, so that's kind of nice. Same thing here. There's Hall of Justice, right? The block would have been here. Is the Hall of Justice right there. One of many, many pictures of what went on in that area. <clears throat> this is an interesting picture. This is looking down Sacramento Street, one of Arnold Gent's more famous pictures. And, uh, you know, it's fires in the distance. People have lost the fronts of their buildings. They're all standing in the street, not running not panicking. There's no movie ever shows them standing around waiting to see what happens. Anyway, but the second part of this, I will tell you the, the preliminary. In, 19, in 2005, I was hired by the Oakland Museum to be a, a consultant for their earthquake uh, representation that they were doing, as all the museums in the Bay Area were doing. And I, I, you know, I, I saw that picture many times, but I hadn't seen this picture, which is the same picture. It's just a blow-up of that. Those folks are not uh, blacks brought in from Hunter's Point. They didn't bust them in. 
these people live there. So the, the person who was curating that exhibit said, John, here's what I'd like you to do. I want to know before and after. Where were these various minorities before the earthquake, and where did they go after? Said, well, that's fairly easy. The Irish were south of Mark, and the Irish moved out of the Mission District. Okay, fine. She said, fine. How about Chinese? Well, I think they came back. I had to find out. What about African Americans? Excuse me? I didn't, I didn't know what to do with that story. So I had to dig and figure it out. And this is one of the things that got me going, was there's a picture. Why is there people who are obviously African American standing on Sacramento Street watching the fire because they live there? That was the resonance of So what about the Western Edition? Didn't, not at all. What about South of Market? Very, 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 very few. So I had, how do you find that out? Anybody named Brown or Carter doesn't make them African American. But you got to go to the census. And you go through the census, in this case, the 1900 census, and you go across, and this is tedious work, and they were using a B for black, and they were using an M for mulatto or mixed. So that was my key. Okay. All right. You guys good? Okay. A little bit off. So this got me going with doing that research of what happened to certain ethnic groups prior to the earthquake and after the earthquake. And this one was the hardest to do it. What's my next clue? Look for their churches. The AME <coughs> church was right up the block from there. There was also the so-called Colored Baptist Church was two blocks the other direction. In those days, you didn't take Muni to go to church. You didn't have a car. You walked to church. So the rest was pretty easy. I went through all these buildings and just checked the, the census record, and there they all were. Families like this, um, interesting occupations, all that kind of stuff. But that's taking you off my basic story of Chinese. All right, so let's just go down the line here. This is looking down. Oh, what street is it? Oh, there's the Sing Fat story, so it's at the bottom of the hill. So this would be right on uh, off of Grant, I believe. You can see the degree of de destruction. You can see why things came down so rapidly. Not because it was shoddy. It was poor design. It was design of all of downtown except for the more contemporary buildings that had been built in the, in the early part of the 20th century that were using concrete. Here's a picture I have in my collection from April 25th. The fire starts on the 18th of April. This is the end of the next week. It's Sunday. Same story. There's that building right there. <coughs> that building is the back end of St. Mary's. I put St. Mary's in there just to give us a reference point. It was gutted. It was totally burned out. No, no uh, playing around with that story. All right, so let's move on to the next one. The same, did I use that twice? Okay, here we have the same kind of thing. Same thing, you keep the facade, the bricks stayed in place, but you, you simply gutted out the interior of these buildings. Everything's flammable anyway, and then on top of that, you've got wooden floors and uh, wooden roofs and all that kind of stuff. So. There was no hope for any of this stuff. Same story, Grace, uh, <coughs> St. Mary's Cathedral, or St. Mary's uh, Church, and Grand Avenue. We'll see more of that later. All right, ruined DuPont Street, now Grand Avenue. The Chinese were almost uh, evicted from Chinatown. Well, that's a little bit strong, but it's not quite the same thing. I recognize that, the back end of St. Mary's Church. This is Grand Avenue, or not. Grand Avenue then, but it is uh, DuPont Street, heading towards the bay. Another picture, and in the distance, we have that same building right there, which was the Hall of Justice, which is right over, was right over here on Kearney, where the uh, Imperial Hotel is. So that was the Hall of Justice site. All right. And, of course, this one is just, it's just kind of creepy. Anyway, which... With such total destruction of Chinatown, where did the Chinese go? They may have been some, there may have been some deaths in Chinatown, but that would only be speculation since the fire was 
moving westward. It had come from south of market. It was heading towards the west. Part you never hear about was that morning was described as rather eerie and rather unusual. What was that called? It's what we call an offshore flow. If you're from Southern California, you call it the Santa Ana winds. It's from the warm land heads towards the ocean. And we've all experienced it. I can remember when the Oakland Hills fire, I got up that morning and went out to grab the newspaper and said, God, it's unusually warm this time of the morning. And the heat is coming from the ocean, not from the ocean, it's coming from the land. That's exactly what happened on April 18th. The, the ocean was drawing heat from the from you know, from Oakland or wherever, from the land, and that's why everything was, was sending itself west. That will change two days later, and uh, we save Van Ness Avenue because the wind changed, and now we're blowing normally what we regularly expect with the, when, where the wind is blowing from the ocean towards the land. All right, there may have been some deaths in Chinatown, but would only be speculation because we don't really know. And almost all the residents had warning it was approaching. There was no water to fight the infer inferno. And the only hope of s saving the neighborhood was to dynamite buildings. And that's one of the problems. They dynamited a building right up here at Clay and Kearney. And they used black powder. And it just, boom, took off again. Black powder is highly... Ins uh, Incendiary, it's not the kind of powder you use for fire, for uh, stopping a fire. Because if you, if you blow out the, uh, the material the fire wants to have, which is wood, paper, any of the combustibles, now you might re stop the fire. But anyway, the Chinese residents fo uh, followed other fleeing residents and headed west towards the Presidio. Okay, not too big a uh, surprise. So what do they, where do they go? Well, the Chinese residents were the first, were first evacuated to the foot of Manus Avenue. <clears throat> okay. There, there was a, there had been an estimated 10,000 persons left homeless from Chinatown. There's no record exactly where they spent the first few week after the fly, fire, but I do have one picture if it was clearer and you would see that man is Chinese, and there's a couple of others in here. There's not a lot of pictures down there, but that is at the foot of Van Ness Avenue, basically an aquatic park area, and there's this kind of very hodgepodge. Nobody was organizing things except that the military had started giving all their supply of tents. All their pup tents had, had been given from the uh, Presidio of San Francisco, and then you're on your own. So that's where the Chinese were for the first few days, at least. We know that. <clears throat> second location. The second location was designated for the Chinese uh, location designated for the Chinese refugees. Chinese were moved out of the warehouse area, uh, the has the, not the hassle, the uh, 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 anyway warehouse area after a few days and relocated to the southeast corner of the Presidio, identified as the Golf Links. You may recognize in that map where Arguello is coming right through there. <laughs> it's Arguello. So right off of there, and that today is still the golf, the golf course of the Presidio. That lasted maybe a day at most, two at, at max. The press reported there was a uh, protest by the matrons in Pacific Heights about the smell of Chinese cooking being blown by the Western Zephyrs. The word Zephyr just turned me on. I love the fact that anybody used that word at all. There are <laughs> pictures of that. There are no pictures of that camp. There is a pictures later after the Chinese were, were moved out of there, but that was the situation. That camp was very temporary and the Chinese were not allowed in the general hospital camp, which had over 2,000 2, people. This was about eh, less than 1,000, which is Tennessee Hollow. So where were they moved to? Out here. Right there. It's called Fort Winfield Scott. It gets confused because Fort Point's official name was Fort Winfield Scott. So it gets confused and some people say, oh, they went to Fort Point. No, they never went to Fort Point. They're on that nasty ridge as you're driving up to uh, the bridge by off of 25th Avenue and up, up there, that's the ridge. It was later used, they, by 1915, they started building barracks for the coast artillery people, and so that's still there, 
but it's windy, it's not pleasant. The entire issue of where and how many Chinese would be housed in camps is very muddled. The second or the third site, designated as the Chinese-only camp, was selected near the western ridge of the Presidio. The official record indicates that Camp 3 was opened on May 9th. I don't know where those days in between May 18th and May 9th are, but May 9th, they were on their own for a while there. Uh, 1906, the population between 60, according to the newspaper, official record says it's 186 people. It's in there someplace. Not a lot of people. We're talking 10,000 people, and that's all we got left. It, along with other three camps uh, run by the military, the Presidio, it would be closed on June 12th. The military didn't like running civilians anything and particularly a camp where you were responsible for all that kind of stuff. So essentially, they, they, they set them up, they knew how to do latrines, they knew how to do field uh, uh, maneuvers and all that kind of stuff, so the military had that knowledge, but they didn't want to be the administrators of these things. So essentially, they closed all these Presidio camps by June 12th, including the one and only designated Chinese camp. So... <laughs> uh, President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt was in office at the time, uh, got word from telegrams from the West Coast saying that the Chinese were being pushed around. And so they sent the Chinese vice counsel to visit the, to investigate the uh, accusations of, of poor treatment of the Chinese. This picture was taken at Fort Mason. They're going to have a meeting with the uh, with uh, General Funston, and that's the vice consul is there in the middle, and these are all representatives of the Chinese community. This lower picture here on the left is a candid photo taken at Camp 3, it's the only one I've ever found, but the third picture is the one that gets, has always gotten to me. It's, it's the picture is a posed picture. There is the official bureaucratic guy who was supposed to check them out. Of course, what does his report say? They're doing just fine. Everything is just fine. They're all, they put a family scene, not a bunch of guys, but a family scene. They've got their best clothes, which is probably the only clothes they had to go out, out with anyway. So that's the game. The game was to keep attrition and push the Chinese further and further away. So here's the better story. What's going on here? Why am I not moving? There we go. Where did the Chinese go? They went to Oakland. In Oakland, and also the other thing is, all transportation on Southern Pacific's ferries was free. Nobody had any money. Their banks were all closed, and so Southern Pacific, out of the goodness of their heart or wherever else, they let everybody on free. So the Chinese could get out of town within another week. And where did they go? They went to Willow Camp in Oakland. It was between 8th and 9th Street, downtown Oakland, on the edges of Lake Merced. Numbers, I've never hunted down. There, there was quite a number of Chinese there. But they got smart. We're not going to put up with this garbage. We're getting out of Dodge. And they did. The second one is tents were provided on the site and employment available at the Pacific Coast Canning Company. That's, that's it, 12th and uh, uh, Pine and 12th in downtown Oakland. You can see the outside. Did you lose me there? Oh, hey. The outside of the building, obviously, that was, could be set up. He, and the man you need to know about is Lu Hing. Never heard of him until I did this this consulting for the Oakland Museum, and they have all the Lu Hing stuff. So I found out who he was. Very enterprising man. Look him up because if you don't want to know a Chinese story that's very, very in intriguing that nobody ever tells about was Lu Hing. And Lu Hing came over here as a young man. He got into figuring out how to put things in cans so they didn't go bad and that you could sell them and, and, and move produce around. And he did, he had. He had other factories uh, up in, or, or canning operations, definitely up in Stockton. He had other ones around. He actually owned uh, a cotton 
cotton plantation down in Mexico. He was an amazing, amazing guy. And this was his product. His product was called Buckskin. Buckskin uh, brand. <clears throat> so he goes American as possible. Very wealthy guy. He's on the, uh, the boards of, of all the major things in, in Chinatown, San Francisco. Part of his day was in San Francisco. Part of his day was in Oakland. He's a hero. And he's a hero that is completely lost. And I can't go into any more detail. But if you want to look him up, Lu Hing, very easy um, to, to find out who this guy was and what he was responsible for doing to saving his own community. Then we have a last camp, one more camp. And this one is really obscure. It took me a long time to figure out what was going on here. Earthquake shack housing in Portsmouth Square, right over here at Portsmouth Square. There's no evidence that Chinese burned out of Chinatown were allowed to have mixed race temporary housing in San Francisco after that chaotic temporary first camp at the foot of Annis Avenue. But by December 18th in 1906, 153 wooden earthquake cottages, we call them shacks, <laughs> built in Portsmouth Square to provide improved shelter during the winter of 1906-1907, which incidentally was a horrendous, horrendous rainstorm. They didn't know that coming in. Uh, that's when they opened it. Uh, look, about 40 of the structures were allotted to be occupied by Chinese families, since the rest would be whoever else was, was in that camp. Uh, the other, uh, the other uh, 60%. <clears throat> Since the maximum camp population had been 388 people, it's likely that the cottage is sheltering between 150 and 160 Chinese families. The allotment was usually for a person who had children would be first, widows first, came in first, families that could provide for themselves were not given housing, this type of housing. So we had camps in Golden Gate Park. Park Presidio Boulevard had camps. All kinds of camps. So those were all segregated against the Chinese. This is the only Chinese camp I could find. It was called Camp 30. They left out some of the numbers in, the, in 1 to 30, and so there was uh, uh, the last of the 25 cottage camps. So there were 25 cottage camps. This is the last one built. It was torn down and dismantled in May 28th of 1907. Finally, the Chinese finally get a little piece of the pie, but not much. All right, so what's going on with the artifacts from Chinatown? That guy ain't Chinese, I'll tell you that, number one. <clears throat> Down on Market Street, you set up a stall, and you had these artifacts, some of which you see out in the hall there and elsewhere, were for sale. They went through the, the rubble and got all these kinds of things, and you sold them to the tourists. That was the game, and they were selling other things. They were selling all kinds of artifacts along Market Street and a couple of other streets, but primarily along Market Street, were tourists. A lot of tourists came to see the ruins of San Francisco. A lot of people came for the work, so they had a very big population coming to San Francisco. All right, so what did they propose after the earthquake and fire were going to go do to the Chinese? This had come up before the earthquake and fire, but this is the fanciful uh, drawing of the new Chinese village that we have proposed for you, going back to the 19, you know, those early uh, references to, to uh, Jimmy Phelan. Oh, this will be so lovely. It's on the water, and it's out there in this lovely part of San Francisco, and so forth and so on. What do the Chinese do? Forget you. They'd not buy this for a moment. They said, we ain't going to do that. Oh, well, we have another plan for you. The second proposed new location would be down here on Sansom Street. So I put in in red there, that's Chinatown. This is the new location that's in that kind of a turquoise, uh, well, a light blue color, let's say, uh, between, uh, you know, Sansom in front, West Jackson 2, down to the waterfront. Actually, the picture goes another block past what, Chinatown, but, I mean, past Jackson, but doesn't matter. You get the idea. It was warehouse country. It was nothing desirable. It had all been flattened by the earthquake and primarily the fire. Again, the Chinese said, we ain't playing. We're not going to take your offer. And the white establishment was kind of incensed. 
why would we have such a wonderful room provide for you so well? So basically, what did happen? Why the plan to remove the Chinese failed? Number one, the Chinese community fought back. The Chinese consulate building was owned by the nation of China, as well as some other properties were owned by overseas investors. Can't touch that, can't say, well, eminent domain, it belongs to somebody outside of this country. Number two, or B, the few properties in Chinatown had been purchased by local Chinese prior to the uh, 1882 Exclusion Act. So after the Exclusion Act of 1882, new ch more Chinese could not come into this country, and there were some Chinese who did make some money and did buy property. So they own property. Again, it's very hard to go through uh, some form of eminent domain to get the property away from somebody who actually has legal documents saying, I own the property. And number C is that Chinese benevolent societies stayed unified and threatened to move to uh, the lucrative Chinese trade markets and tourism business to Seattle. You don't like us? We're going to Seattle. Game over. I mean, there's the, 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 they're busy trying to rebuild the city, and the Chinese aren't playing ball. And the Chinese essentially uh, won the battle. They got lawyers. They got all the right uh, way that you fight any kind of, of uh, illegal uh, form of, of <coughs> getting you off your property. Number two, of course, the Burnham Plan implementation, uh, implementation would be impossible after the earthquake and fire. It would seem all the property that had been cleared by the fire would be an advantageous or an advantage for starting anew. But the reality was that the majority of the property owners believed in the mantra that the new San Francisco could be built safer, the city would boom, and prosperity was almost guaranteed. No property owners wish to relinquish any square footage of for some kind of fanciful city beautiful scheme. Burnham would come out here two more times trying to sell his program. We were building too quickly and there was no way we were going to go with, with, with the Burnham plan because it was too fanciful and everybody had to get back to building the city. So uh, the Chinese fell into a good deal because of the Burnham plan, not uh, the Burnham plan did not uh, force them out of Chinatown and actually played into the advantage that they got to stay. The pivot. The Chinese merchants and civil leaders listened and debated the concept of the new Chinatown, which allowed them to continue their import export business while playing up a Caucasian tourist fantasy that emphasized the stereotype of inscrutability and the unique, unique habits of the Orientals. So suddenly we're pivoting. The Chinese who were under, uh, who five years earlier were, were, had to be getting, gotten rid of, the Chinese say, hey, we've got a better plan, and they went along with a plan, is that, hey, you are a huge asset to us, not a liability. If you think about Chinatown, it's right between the financial district and Knob Hill. I mean, it was prime real estate. San Francisco became a boom town uh, with reconstruction work along with tourism to see the new San Francisco transformed. And that's basically what happened. It's simplistic, but anyway. Here, here is the, the uh, drawings, the architectural drawings of Sing Fat. I'll go with the left on, uh, down lower here, which is, this is Sing Fat. Right over here will be Saint, uh, Old St. Mary's Church. And across the intersection from that, going, let's see if I can do it right, going this way would be this one was Sing Chong. Sing Chong, it has a second name, was used for a while. Architects Ross and Burnham. They knew nothing about Chinese architecture. They had some, they had some fancy kind of things. The Chinese laughed at them because that's the only thing in China that was sort of a uh, religious kind of building. They didn't build like that. They built China much more practically, but they wanted to create this image of this Chinese village that everyone will come to see. And here it is under construction. It was called Nanking Fuk Wu uh, Company Building. We also know it as Sing Chong. Under construction and the uh, nearing, nearing completion. And here it is that we're standing up the street, on Upper California Street, 
and we're looking right down the middle of them. One is Sing Fat, which is on the on the uh, south side, and on the other side is Sing Chong, and you can see the obvious uh, uh, St. Mary's uh, Church right there, right across from St. Chong. So that is, and of course you can see the cable car line going up California Street. The Chinese were here to stay. The Chinese were not about to be moved. <coughs> Here's another view of the same kind of thing, nearing completion. You can see that pagoda kind of roof is under construction and all that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> so here's a picture that I thought was fascinating because same two buildings, California Street looks like it's over, but we're really on the curve of one side of it. And look at the bricks are all stacked there. And that's what they did. They cleaned bricks, not the Chinese. Somebody else was doing the cleaning. And those bricks would be rebuilt, would be used to rebuild a lot of downtown San Francisco, but also Chinatown. It's all about what you put inside the building, it's all about the structure of the building, but the use of brick was widely used. I remember it being in 450 Center at the dentist's office looking out the window, and all the backs of those buildings were all brick. The fronts were not. Now, here's the big interesting portion that most people have ever heard of. The Portola Festival of 1909. By 1909, the business community in San Francisco began planning a big celebration of excessive reconstruction. For late October of 1909, the plan was to make it a grand party with building, decorated parades, sporting, and motor events. But the star of the show would be the new San Francisco. So, uh, the Chinese community would be full participants in this event and visiting crowds would want to make a visit to the new Chinatown. Again, that same pivot and taking advantage of and embracing, the population is embracing the Chinese as an asset, not a liability. On the far right, we have, this is just a postcard that uses the Sing uh, Fat, the uh, building or Sing Chong? No, I think it's, it's, it's Sing Fat. Um, and, you know, decorations and all that kind of stuff, it's all just a, artist conception, but there's the fireworks nightly at Union Square. They didn't go to get their fireworks in, uh, in Omaha. You know where they got their fireworks. Again, merchants are selling them all kinds of things. Bell of Lights, intersection of 3rd Market, and Kearney Street. Every night, they lit those lights, and it just was a huge uh, festive event. Here is the two major buildings, and you can see how they participated 100% they decorated up their buildings. They were part of part of the fabric of this new San Francisco. The parades. I just took, pulled the Chinese out. Because the, the Japanese are equally as, as spectacular. But anyway, the Chinese division led off with the traditional dragon. I got from two sites. I didn't like this picture as much as I like this picture, so I put the two of them together. But that's the whole idea. They brought the, the dragon. Or did they make it up in some little loft in Chinatown? No, they imported it all from Hong Kong. They spent much and much and much and much of money to get their uh, this kind of stuff, which is only available from China. And so they planned ahead. They ordered all the artifacts for the parade and other decorations within Chinatown from the merchants in Asia. And here it is, you know, the Chinese maiden on a horse. I don't know the mythology of all that, but this is walking right down Market Street. Uh, and a woman on a horse, I think that was rather unusual. Um, but you see, there, there's sort of, somebody walks with them, they're wearing the traditional costumes. Again, the same thing. All these costumes had been imported from uh, China. And Eight Immortals, the top right street down, they countermarched. They went all the way out to uh, around uh, Mission Dolores and did a little piece on Venice Avenue, and they came back down Market Street. I mean, if you're wearing those little soft shoes, that was tough on your little toesies, I believe. And then because the dragon boat, all the kind of traditional Chinese um, myth mythological stuff was being demonstrated. White people had never seen this. They had no clue that this culture had such rich and, and uh, uh, opulent kinds of of, uh, of demonstration of their of their culture. It just it was not known, and the press represented that well. There were 
ecstatic about Chinese and the Japanese, the well, but we're not here to talk about the Japanese. The, there, there's the Chinese division parade of went out and circled around Mission Dolores. That's the picture on the right side. This is an oddball. This was put along the streetcar tracks. There was five of these things that were stationary. And they put it out on the last night of the of the thing. They pulled them all out. They put a little band. A little combo would be right in here in the middle, and you could go from one to another all along Market Street, every two blocks, and you could sing and dance and whatever else. There's one that's an Eskimo one. There are various. But the Chinese, again, weren't going to be denied. They were going to participate, and they were going to participate to the max. All right, so the Portland Festival of 1909 was a huge success. Six weeks after it closed, the meeting, a meeting was held in the Merchants Exchange Building to solicit funds and form a committee to get congressional approval for San Francisco to host the celebration of the completion of the Panama Canal, which was project out, projected out to be sometime about 1914. This would be a massive tourist attraction favorable to all merchants in the city, obviously the Chinese as well. The lead up to the PPIE alone greatly increased tourist traffic to San Francisco. If you're representing these, you know, the, the, the uh, Indiana or one of the other states, you had to sell a den send the delegation out to see where in the, in the, uh, in the city they were going to put your various things, your, your, your buildings and all that kind of stuff. Same thing with Ford. So this major traffic comes through San Francisco all in preparation for the PPIE. From 1910 to 1913, tourism in San Francisco accelerated. Uh, <clears throat> industry, industrial and uh, fraternal groups had conventions in San Francisco during those years. All had parades. All would have visited Chinatown, right? Large, <clears throat> with large attendance. There was politi uh, political issues and graft scandals during that time the trials and all that kind of stuff, but tourism still flourished and the new Chinatown prospered because of that tourism. By 1911, China experienced a major revolution under Sun Yat-sen. They're now going to have a Chinese republic. And the Chinese community generally embraced the change towards modernization in their ancestral homeland. The second Portola Festival was in 1913. We've already guaranteed we're going to have the Panama Pacific International Exposition. By 13, it's just putting more frosting on the cake. But it's interesting to see how the Chinese responded to the second port law, which was not as grand as the first one. <clears throat> but before we get to that, let's start with this. Because I have been very curious about what was the, what were tourists coming to see in Chinatown? Were they wandering around on their own during the day they were? But sightseeing in San Francisco became a huge, huge thing. There was a number of competing of, of companies. They would take you down to Market Street, take you, show you through the city, end up at uh, the Cliff House, and you'd have your picture taken, and then they would sell you a picture, and then they'd go on for the rest of the thing. So this is a huge thing. I spent a lot of time on this topic, but I just want to show you where it takes us. The person who runs that individual tour <laughs> they used to call him the megaphone man. The megaphone man, or one of his associates, would try to sell you for a second tour. And the second tour was called Seeing San Francisco Chinatown After Dark. And this was, this is a, actually be a 1911 uh, set of pictures, but I mean, and the ticket. So one side of your ticket had a, a second ticket you, you could tear off and present at 8 o'clock at night uh, to go for the Chinatown trip. And this was all part of the same game. So what was in this trip? This is the 1911 brochure, which gave you lots of insight. You start at Third Market, you travel to Union Square, this is our new great uh, 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 shopping district, then through the Cafe District and back to see Market Street at night on the Chinatown. So this is essentially what I'm showing you here, is that you start here, and here is all the things you would see as you went around. And here we start to get the interesting portion, this portion right into here. All right, there is on the Chinatown, where there is a 15-minute stop at the smoking room, 
smoking room. <clears throat> this is a very nicely concealed uh, sense that you were actually in an old opium den. And, you know, they'd set up a brazier with, uh, with, with some dried, uh, with some incense and some dried orange peel and maybe a few poor things, and they'd light it, and people came down and said, oh, that must really be opium. And then they went back to see their family in Omaha and said, I was in Chinatown, and I was in an opium den. Yeah, it's all, it's all, hey, not very far, it wasn't much different, definitely, uh, <coughs> the, uh, a few more of those attractions were much different. So the smoking room in a Joss house. What is the Joss house? It's strictly a religious shrine. There's numbers of these around in Chinatown, and you went for one for prosperity. You went for another one to pray, essentially, to the god of health or whatever else it is that somebody is ill. So the Joss house, we made a big deal out of this, like it's some kind of weird, strange thing. It was simply a religious shrine. Fifteen minutes was allotted for shopping, of course. Fifteen minutes for Mrs. Wong's tea room, and uh, that's an interesting story. I won't get into it. Ten more uh, at the check. Excuse me, at the Chinese telephone office, grand building. You may have seen pictures. Thirty minutes for performances, Chinese homes, and drugstore and theater. So that's all packaged together, and that's thirty minutes, a lot of time. <coughs> Then you went on to the Rue de Terrifique, the Barber Coast. Uh, you returned back to the financial district. So let's talk about just this little bit right here. So, we're good. Okay. So, what happens when you go on this tour? You stop off at the uh, smoking room, you come around here, and then you do this. You stop to see a Chinese family. You went into their apartment, and the children put on a little performance for you. And there was to be a little a bowl in the, uh, on the way out where you could leave some money, or you could buy a postcard. They sold you postcards. So this is all part of this whole thing of capitalizing on our exotic Chinese neighbors, you know, that kind of stuff. And then when you went on from there, they took you to the Barbary Coast, at which point... <laughs> They can see the truck coming down or the vehicle coming down. Suddenly the band went into the thing and the girls came out and they charged you a dime to dance with them for two minutes. And then, oh, the, you know, the tour is leaving. So that's it. You know, it's all basically fleecing the tourists, but that was just one of the many things. But the Chinese were part of that. Excuse me. The Chinese were definitely part of that and they took full advantage of uh, the gullibility of the tourists. All right, let's go on. And this is very gawking and shopping. This is nighttime pictures in Chinatown. Some of it, they love this picture. I never did, but they love this picture here, which shows, you know, the Chinese family, probably a couple of wives. That's a pre-quake picture. There was much better uh, representation of women after the quake, but not dramatically different. So I'll just move on to that. And... 1913, this is the official souvenir postcard of that one. Chinatown looks pretty much the same it did in 1909. For the, second, for the first port law, this is the second port law. And here's a difference. Look at this. Chinese community participates in 1913 port law festival parade. Looks decidedly more Western than in 1909. These are their own costuming. I don't know what was brought from China, to, uh, from China, but you can see the men are not in those traditional long robes. They are looking very rest Western, even more Western. The message on the side of this community, uh, community float reads, monarchy is dead, long live the republic. So that's what it says right across there. I wrote that up. Again, they're using horses again, but the next one really fascinates me. <laughs> it's like, I, it is just simply a flatbed truck. They created the upper portion to look like it's part of the vehicle itself, and then they create this big platform up there, women, young women up there, and the whole thing uh, going down Market Street, a more modern float than in 1909. And now we have the, the what I like the most, where we have this man representing Uncle, Uncle Sam, and this is the diplomat from China. Again, 
you know, this is, this is uh, all play acting. You can read the rest of it, Gratitude to the United States, that first welcomed the Republic of China. That became a big thing in, in Chinatown. We are being accepted now because our country our, of origin is being accepted as well. And, but the Panama Pacific Exposition wasn't quite as nice to the Chinese as these images portray. The Republic of China had grand exhibits at the Panama Pacific Exposition 1915 that pleased the local Chinese community, obviously what I've got on the right, um, on, my, um, on my left, excuse me. However, the second one, the amusement section of the exposition called the Joy Zone reverted to racial stereotyping. Mo movie picture mogul, or he owned a member of, of theaters, Sid Grauman, and a group of his investor friends sublet a concession called Underground Chinatown, which highly offensive stereotypes of pre-quake Chinatown. There was a series of tableau of wax figures uh, depicting opium smoking in squalid opium dens and the uh, representation of the sexual of white uh, sexual slavery. The exhibit only lasted for about two months before the Chinese community raised holy hell, and it would be changed somewhat to be called now underground slumming, and they replaced all the Chinese representations uh, with, with something a little less. But you can see, if you can see, here we have, you know, <clears throat> the dope fiend's dream and all this stuff which you can't quite see as clearly as I can in my, on my computer, are all representations of that same stereotype that the Chinese are beneath our dignity, the Chinese are simply uh, a lower class of human beings that preys on their own and anybody else. The 1906 earthquake and fire physically wiped out the Chinese ghetto, but through tenacity and wise planning, the Chinese were not driven from San Francisco. The elders of the community used legal and financial resources available to fight to remain, expand the boundaries, and contribute economically and culturally to the city and region. Broader integration into more areas of San Francisco and the state would be a longer struggle, which was hastened by the veterans' benefits from World War II to purchase homes well beyond Chinatown. Let's take questions. Angus. Yes, Sid Drummond liked what he had done in uh, PPIE and would incorporate it in Los Angeles as Grauman's Chinese Theater, same Sid Grauman. He owned a number of, uh, he owned two, two theaters in San Francisco in, in that teen period, and then he, he had some in some of the other uh, communities in the Bay Area, uh, so he was a wheeler and dealer when it came to theaters, and then he moved to Los Angeles as things got more uh, exciting in the 20s. Yeah. More questions. Yes? That's a question. Sure. Uh, oh, we have a second mic. When did the uh, Exclusion Act end? The Exclusion Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act, well, it goes way back. I mean, the, the exclusion stuff starts in the, in, in, in after the Chinese start arriving. But the first act would be 1882, and that essentially said, no more Chinese. Now, the only people Chinese people who could return to China would either be a merchant or a clergyman. Everybody else was restricted from returning to China. So that was part of the Exclusion Act. There would be, it was every 10 years, it came up again in 1892, it came up in, 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 18, in 1902. It was a series of acts definitely against the Chinese who were going to be undercutting our economy. <laughs> they would be taking jobs from good European workers. Never. <laughs> when, did, when did that end, if you hadn't heard the question? It, it goes through a series of morpings over time. 
Even this last one is not until uh, legislation that came down from the military saying you can't continue to discriminate against Chinese. And so exclusion acts or uh, the housing acts and all that kind of stuff all start collapsing after the Second World War because many Chinese did serve in the, in the, in the military and had a GI Bill to, to, to use. My neighbor for, last, for at least the last 40 years was one of those people. I asked him his story. Yes, we lived in Chinatown. Yes, we had all this stuff, but I had been in the Second World War and I used my GI Bill to buy this lovely house in the Richmond District. Common story, extremely common story. Yes, okay. Any other questions? Yes. This building, yes. Is that the same picture that shows these two columns in a pile? Yep. Yeah. So this is you know, this is this is a historic building, and uh, it needs to be. <laughs> people need to understand that it is the real deal. So yeah, and it's the first mint also. It is the first mint. Uh, bullion was was uh, was transformed into coin here in this building in uh, what about 1852, 56. Did, 53 was the beginning of all that stuff, yeah. It would last a point until a larger mint was built down on Fifth and Mission. Uh, you know, goes around, comes around, right? Okay. Any other questions? All right. I, I, I have a tendency to tell you too much. That's why there's no questions. Thank you. Thank you.